Today on Blue 58, the Packers are about a week away from their first preseason game. So what should we be watching for? I'll tell you what's at the top of my list. Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of thepowersweep.com. I'm your host, John Meerdink. Very happy to be with you here for another episode. We're about a week out from uh, a something resembling real actual football here. We've got family night scrimmage this weekend. We've got a bunch of storylines going on. So during this episode, we're going to sort out what we should be watching for, what I'll be watching for at least, during the Packers' first preseason game. Before we do that, I want to take a second, and this is going to be my, I guess, habit for training camp. Every time we have an episode, I want to recap uh, some of the storylines that have popped up since we last spoke. So we've got a few of them to talk about here. First, Josiah DeGuara is back. Small asterisk on back. He's doing individual work in practice. But even doing that in pads, basically 10 months after an ACL tear, is pretty darn good. And this is an exciting moment, I think, for Matt LaFleur especially. He is He represents a chess piece that LaFleur had to do without for all of last season. DeGuara, a good athlete for the position he plays, good size, and probably the the most skilled version of what he is on the Packers roster. So what is he specifically? He's the F. He's not an H-back. He's not a tight end. The The actual position is an F. And uh, for a more in-depth explanation as to what that exactly is, uh, check out our piece on Patreon about how the Packers use their fullbacks. That uh, That is a post I've unlocked for everybody to take a look at. There is a link in your show notes if you want to look at that um, while you're listening to this or after you're listening to this, you can go ahead and do so. But um, that is what he's going to be doing. Lining up all over the place, a lot of motion, uh, basically acting like a fullback who moonlights as a tight end or sometimes a tight end that moonlights as a fullback. It's a a blend of both, but HMAC doesn't really cover it either, so that's what Josiah DeGuara is going to be doing. Uh, got a follow-up question after I tweeted out some information on uh, Daniel Crawford, the Packers' new tight end, that kind of relates to this. Uh, Lord of the Hundreds on Twitter asks uh, regarding Crawford, an unathletic tight end but a decently athletic fullback. I'd love to know more and why. So the, the question here relates to relative athletic score. Uh, the Packers' newest tight end, Daniel Crawford, is something like a four eight one as a tight end, and he's in the upper sixes as a fullback. The reason for that is uh, basically size and athleticism relative to other people at the position. So Crawford is pretty small for a tight end. He's only about six foot two, and he weighs about two hundred and fifty one pounds. Look at him compared to guys like, well, say Mercedes Lewis. This is, I guess, the peak example on the Packers. Six foot seven, upper two sixties, maybe close to two seventy. That's pretty small in comparison, or or Crawford is pretty small in comparison, but relative to other fullbacks, he is bigger and heavier and moves better than some of those guys. That's really what relative athletic score is trying to measure, and you're kind of looking for guys that move around a lot in terms of athleticism for that F position in the Packers offense. Josiah DeGuara is kind of in the same boat. He's about six foot two, six foot three, two hundred and fifty pounds or so, which puts him on the smaller end for a tight end, but he's awful big uh, for a fullback. And he moves better than most fullbacks do. So the the relative part of relative athletic score is really what we're looking at here. Relative to other players at the position, Crawford is small for a tight end, but pretty big and pretty athletic. Uh, for a fullback. That's all that we're looking at there, and that's what the Packers really are looking at when they, they try to fill that that F role. Uh, small nugget out of training camp, uh, Aaron Rodgers apparently reached out to Jordan Love several times during the offseason, both to check in on how Jordan Love was doing and uh, to let Jordan Love know where he was at. This is a good nugget, I think, for Aaron Rodgers to drop because you're kind of controlling the narrative here. If you're positioning yourselves against an organization, you want to make yourself look as good as possible. And Aaron Rodgers, I think, has taken some pains to to clear up over the last week, like, look, hey, I'm not the bad guy here. Um, not explicitly, but he has made some comments along those lines. So from that aspect alone, this is a smart thing for Aaron Rodgers to do. Say, hey, look, um, I'm not trying to, to mess with Jordan Love here. 
I just want him to, to stay in the loop, let him know that I'm rooting for him, and let him know what I'm thinking. But it's also just a good thing to do. Uh, Aaron Rodgers has been painted, I think, quite unfairly over the years as a bad leader. And to be fair, there are some things that I think you can criticize about Aaron Rodgers, just some of the reports about how he interacts with some people, you know, acting a little aloof sometimes, but that is just kind of his personality too. But generally speaking, there, there are a lot of people who really talk about him pretty highly as a leader. And this is something that I think is a, a, a good example of good leadership. Reaching out to someone who is affected by your decisions is a good thing to do. And Rodgers appears to have done that this offseason. Inside linebacker Ray Bill Wilborn is back from the COVID list. This is good for him and good for the Packers. He is a long shot, but with similar physical dimensions to Chris Barnes, you never really know. And it's clear there, given what the Packers have been doing with Kamal Martin, that there are opportunities to be had at inside linebacker with Martin out of the picture, at least temporarily or, or partially. There aren't that many people on he- on the depth chart ahead of a guy like Wilborn. You've got Devondre Campbell and Chris Barnes for sure, uh, but then it's Isaiah McDuffie and Ty Summers. That's only two guys, probably one of which you have to beat to have a real shot at making the roster at inside linebacker, especially if you're a good special teamer. Same kind of story goes for new Packers defensive lineman Josh Avery, big old boy, six foot three, three hundred eighteen pounds, and a great tester to boot. 9.5 relative athletic score there. That number comes up again. And you can see why. 31 inch or 31 bench press reps, good strength. 34 and a half inch vertical, get up, big guy. And a 9.7 broad jump. Uh, the 40 yard dash is nothing to write home about, 5.14. But that doesn't matter for a defensive lineman for reasons that we all understand. But you know what does? He had a 1.71 second split uh, at the 10 yard mark. He's getting off the line in the hurry. In a hurry. In the hurry. That sounds bad. Um, Like Wilborn, there are opportunities for Josh Avery to make some noise, even though though he's joining the game here pretty late. The Packers need bodies on the defensive line, and it's good to have big bodies. Avery is that, and if he can use that strength and that explosiveness to to push the pocket at all, you almost got to give him a look just as... I want to say courtesy, but just as like a favor to yourself, you just don't have many of these guys and anybody who can contribute at all merits a significant look. Also signed this week, uh, Chauncey Rivers, uh, most recently with the Baltimore Ravens, six foot two, 262 pounds out of Mississippi state out of a couple other places as well. Weirdly though, he's a pretty bad tester, which is kind of a tendency breaker for the Packers. 1.21 1.21 relative athletic score. That is for a few reasons. First, he did not test well at all. Uh, 30 and a half inch vertical, 8 foot 10 broad jump. Not explosive there at all. A poor 40 yard dash at 4.97 seconds. Poor agility numbers at a 4.7 short shuttle and a 7.333 cone. That's just not good testing, and I'm sure he'd like to have some of those back. But he's also pretty small for the position he plays. 6'2, 262. Puts you on the, I guess I would say, short and stubby end for an edge rusher. And that's kind of how he's been portrayed here so far. So all of that doesn't really add up to me. So what's the deal here? Why are the Packers signing him? And honestly, I'm not sure what the appeal is, but I have a a couple possible questions or a couple possible solutions here. It's possible that he could be trying to fill that edge role vacated by Randy Ramsey. I'm not entirely convinced by that. Uh, Ramsey, it looks like it's going to be out for a significant amount of time. So they need somebody to take that fourth or maybe fifth edge rusher spot. Rivers doesn't seem like that guy. I wonder if they could be looking to find another guy who can be a nominal outside linebacker, but really line up inside like Zadarius Smith does. I think Carlo Kemp is kind of built in that mode. Rashawn Gary certainly is. But again, he seems kind of too small to fill that role. So that doesn't seem the most likely either. But then reading Lance Zerline's scouting report about him at NFL.com, I wonder if this is the trick. He said in the final line of his overview on Rivers, quote, look for teams to consider him as a 3-4 Sam backer with enough short area athleticism to handle the transition, end quote. 
I wonder if that might be it. So a 3-4 Sam backer would be an off-the-ball 3-4 linebacker, a guy who's not lining up as an edge rusher. And given what the Packers are doing with Kamal Martin, I wonder if that might be it. Kamal Martin's measurables are at least similar. He's significantly lighter than Rivers, but he's about the same height. I wonder if there's a role for a thickly built outside linebacker who lines up off the ball in Joe Barry's defense. Just something to think about. I don't think Rivers is a big-time roster contender. have pretty low expectations for him, but at least keep that in the back of your mind. Final storyline that I want to talk about is that Joe Barry's defense seems different so far in training camp. Aaron Rodgers talked about things looking different, being different, feeling different, whatever, uh, than things have been in the past when he's gone up against defenses in training camp against Mike Pettin and Dom Keppers and things like that. And you don't want to read into this too far. It is August 6th, after all, as I'm recording this. But it's good, I think, that they can confuse Aaron Rodgers at least a little there's a big reason that Matt LaFleur wanted somebody from the Brandon Staley, Staley Vic Fangio scheme tree. It can be really good at its best, and Aaron Rodgers has struggled against that kind of scheme. And I guess the thinking is that if you can confuse Aaron Rodgers, it might be a good idea to try to use that same scheme against other elite quarterbacks around the league. And that seems to be what the Packers are trying to accomplish here. So early returns on Barry's defense seem to be pretty good. So putting this all together, we're about a week out from the Packers' first preseason game. What should we be watching for? Might as well start thinking about it, right? We've got very little else to go on. We've got family night Saturday night, but that's not real football. Uh, It's just practice. So what should we be watching for? I've got two categories of things that I am going to be watching for. First, general things, and then a few specific things relating to specific players. First, the general stuff. Who's the first offensive lineman on the field after the starters? This is like your sixth man type thing, and and it'll tell you a a couple things to think about what the Packers are looking at here. First, do they think they need to work out their depth at tackle or on the interior line more? Secondly, it'll just tell you who their, their sixth guy is. Who's your sixth man on the offensive line? Uh, are you looking at a swing tackle? Are you looking at interior depth? Where are the, the position competitions? Uh, if Lucas Patrick starts, just as an example, at guard, and John Runyon is the first guy off the bat and nothing else in the offensive line changes, that tells you I think the Packers are trying to see how Runyon works with the starters and can it be comparable to Lucas Patrick. The second thing I want to look at here is how the defense feels. We talked about that a little bit with Aaron Rodgers. We, we want to get a look at this, too, as fans, as people who, who cover this team. Does the defense feel fast or slow? Do they feel proactive or reactive? And how are guys playing in new spots? Those of whom are moving to new positions, those who are finding themselves in different role in scheme. For instance, uh, Jair Alexander has played almost exclusively on the outside in his career so far, but there is some talk about playing him at Joe Barry's slot corner star position. Is he going to get any time there? What does it look like when he does? How do the Packers handle rotations up front on the defensive line? Who's getting reps early in downs and who's getting reps in obvious passing situations? Are they just moving their outside linebackers in and rushing them as you know, small, quick defensive tackles like Mike Pettin liked to do on third and longs, or do they stick with a more traditional defensive line and soak up some blocks so guys can rush from the outside? Those are all significant questions about Joe Barry's defense and just some functional things there. Finally, in, in general stuff, who are the punt returners and the punt gunners? These are the easiest special teams things to watch. Who's back there catching punts and how do they do? And who's covering punts when the Packers have to punt? Take a look at those things, and uh, you might get a little inside roster information. As far as specific things, we've got four players I want to look at. First, how does Kylan Hill look? This feels a little bit odd to me as somebody who's been pro Patrick Taylor for a long time here, but I want to see how real this roster competition is between Hill and Taylor and Dexter Williams. I think Hill is probably the odds-on favorite here, given that he's a recent draft pick. 
uh, that he has been the most recently productive in college and that he was the most productive, I think, of all these guys who are competing for that number three job in college at his best. So how does he look? What does he look like on an actual football field? And how does he do in pass protection? What about Josh Jackson? What's he up to? Do they have him playing inside or outside or even lining up as a safety? I'm curious. I am not bullish on Josh Jackson at all, but it's an interesting story. A former second round pick. Where does he fit? What does he do? I'm curious in Joe Barry's defense, what kind of role he has, especially given that Barry's defense is supposed to be more zone focused. Josh Jackson, a zone corner. What does he do? How does he do it? I'm curious. Does Devin Funchess look like he can still play? Reports out of training camp are good, but it's easy to look good when you're a big athletic dude and your job in shorts and helmets is just to look like a big athletic dude. Can he look that good out on the field uh, playing full speed reps against other, other NFL players? It's an open question. Finally, TJ Slayton. Of the Packers rookies, I might be the most curious about him because he's He's pretty unique. Big, big guy who really has no easy comparison on the Packers roster right now. He's kind of one of a kind. I know Kenny Clark is is a nose, at least nominally, but TJ Slayton is a nose tackle's nose tackle. He's built like the big round, heavy tackles of years past, like, like Gilbert Brown, for instance. How does that look? in Joe Barry's defense. Heck, how does that look on an NFL field in 2021? You don't see a lot of guys like him around anymore. How does he play? What does he do? I'm really curious, and uh, I want to see it, and I'm excited to see it a week from this Saturday night. So that's what I'm going to be looking at. Those are the things I'll be checking off in my notebook as we get ready to watch the Packers play. Now for something completely different. We are into Chapter 13 of Blood, Sweat, and Chalk, and we're building on something we talked about last time, the one-back spread. Overall impressions, it is funny, I think, how things change in the NFL. A lot of the stuff that we've talked about in uh, Blood, Sweat, and Chalk so far has related to offensive systems that were once very popular but have now fallen out of favor for reasons both good and bad. That's been a consistent theme here, that things don't stop working, they just kind of go out of fashion. This is entirely the opposite, because the one-back spread was once a foreign term. It was once something that seemed like it came from the moon, and people, when they saw it for the first time, didn't understand what they were looking at, but now it's everywhere, and you see this every single day that you watch NFL football. You might not recognize it, though, because it's called something else. This might be the most common thing in pro football right now, but by a different name. 11 personnel. The personnel alignment that has one back, one tight end, and three wide receivers. And you can customize that a little bit. But basically, that is NFL football right now. The days where you line up with a quarterback under center and two backs behind him and then figure out the rest on the outside is pretty much gone. That doesn't happen as regularly, uh, or really, even even to a level that, that would merit consideration or, or comparison as 11 personnel anymore. Even the Packers last year ran 11 more than they did anything else, and they're one of the, the teams that favored heavier packages. 11 personnel is just NFL football now. The one-back spread is just, in some form, how football is played. And that's a really funny comparison when you think about other things that we've talked about, the 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 wing T was once the same kind of deal. If you weren't playing the wing T, you were going to get hammered because you were just doing something that was totally different from what everyone else was doing in the NFL. But now it's this. This is how people play football in the NFL. And if you're not doing it this way, you better have a really, really good reason why, because you're doing something that cuts against the grain pretty significantly. A couple of interesting notes here. Uh, This is a funny thing about how football works, and also a hilarious moment of honesty. Joe Tiller learning the one-back spread offense simply because Dennis Erickson left his playbook at Wyoming just ticks a lot of boxes for me. First, like I said, hilarious honesty. 
yeah, I, I, I didn't come up with any of this. Uh, Dennis just left a playbook around. I picked it up and said, yeah, that looks pretty good. And we thought we'd continue doing it. Uh, secondly, just the, the way that a decision, either strategic or accidental by Dennis Erickson to forget his playbook, shapes a, a lot of people's careers. Joe Tiller had success with it at Wyoming. A lot of players on Joe Tiller's football team has success as a result. And all of that is because a playbook was just left behind. Related to this, I think it's been interesting throughout this book how often coaches have said some variation of, yeah, just come to campus and I'll teach you whatever you want to know about this new offense that I created or innovated on and that is now tearing up college football. Yeah, If you want to know how to also destroy college football right along with me, I will teach you how. Playbooks in football are pretty sacred, but schemes, I guess, are just whatever. If you want to teach someone your scheme and they are if you're open to that and they just ask, apparently coaches are willing to be like, yeah, whatever, I'll teach you how to do it. Which is funny because a lot of these coaches, especially at the higher levels of college football, are competing for similar recruits and similar jobs, not to mention guys that might be competing against each other other directly, but they're pretty willing to just sit down and say, yeah, this is this is what we're doing. This is how. Here's how you can do it as well. Just a weird sort of fraternity, coaches. Football coaches are weird. Uh, if you ever have the opportunity to listen to a coaching seminar, do it. Uh, listen to what coaches are, are doing and, and trying to teach people. And, and just, you don't even have to absorb the football knowledge. Just watch coaches. I think it's kind of fascinating because they're a weird breed of person. Finally, I think it's funny that this chapter ends on Drew Brees and the bubble scream. Not, not funny like as in actually humorous, but funny just a another nice conjunction of scheme and player. He ends up in a spread offense in college uh, that was not, you know, this wasn't the world's most common thing at the time when he was playing, although it was becoming more and more common. But Breeze, for his entire career, has been known for being a accurate, short passer. That's what you do in the spread. And that's especially what you do in this little bubble screen twist that Purdue is running. Just the perfect confluence of player and scheme. And I guess that is, in a way, in on top of the schemes going in and out of fashion for good and bad reasons the theme of this book, the marriage of players to schemes and figuring out a scheme that goes really well with your players is all coaches are really trying to do. You can get really weird. You can get really hung up on what schemes are doing and what they're like. You can be the esoteric weirdo scheme wise that Bill Belichick is. You can be the bro intellectual that Sean McVay is and show off your I can remember all the plays party tricks. You can be Matt LaFleur and have to work with a, a Hall of Fame quarterback late in his career, whether or not he agrees it's late in his career or, or how that should be handled. But all these guys are are trying to do the same thing. They're trying to sit down and figure out, okay, how can I take what I like to do what I think works, and put that together with the players that we have. How do we figure out the best way to do that? If you do that well, you're going to win a lot of football games. If you do it poorly, you're going to be looking for another opportunity to tell someone, hey, I actually know what I'm doing. Let me try to try to work this out again. That is the struggle of coaching, and that is really how NFL football works. And really, as evidenced by this, work, by this book, Pretty much how it's always worked. That's all I've got for you in this episode. I hope you enjoy this weekend. Enjoy family night. Uh, enjoy these, I guess, late days of summer as it starts to turn towards fall. We get a reminder of that with actual football games starting up. If you enjoyed this podcast, I'd appreciate it a lot if you'd share it with someone else you think would enjoy it because that is the, the number one way we help or we grow. We grow through word of mouth. Um, and, uh, if you share this with someone you think would enjoy it, that would mean a lot to me. And it's going to get more people involved in this, uh, discussion, ongoing conversation we're having about the Packers, which helps all of us, me included, become smarter Packers fans. And as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans and better Packers fans are what we all want to be. 
I'm your host, John Meerdink. We'll see you next time on Blue 58.